Today's uh, webinar will be on the simple way to create stunning infographics using Microsoft PowerPoint. So this is a sort of a theoretical session on uh, the different aspects of infographics and then also um, a sneak preview into what will be covered during the actual two-day workshop. So a little bit about myself first. Uh, my name is Ezekiel. I'm the founder of Meisterclass. Uh, we're actually a presentation design company. So we focus on creating uh, decks that transform how our audience perceive, create, and conduct presentations. Uh, with recent months, we've also started going into more of the content development uh, space. Plus, we've noticed that there's growing demand for that as well. So one thing we've noticed uh, as we've developed content for our clients over the past few years is that there's a growing trend in uh, developing this, what they call infographics. So as you can see from the examples here, right, uh, you'll notice that a lot of them are actually from uh, government agencies or even newspapers. Uh, and the reason behind that is actually, uh, if you think about it, in the past few months because of COVID-19, um, a lot of agencies and the uh, media agencies, they've taken to publishing a lot of these uh, this, uh, sort of PSA public uh, announcements to raise awareness on the do's and don'ts uh, with regards to uh, what you can do when you're outside uh, in this time. Yeah, so uh, I think this is also a good example to show that uh, for the government sector, they're also adopting a lot of this uh, use of infographics, right? So these interfaces are known as infographics. So what differentiates the infographic from the conventional like mailer or uh, document to raise awareness on something? So there are a few distinctive qualities. Okay, so if you look at the image on the right, the one done by ESG, you notice that there are, it's more visually engaging, right? So for starters, if you look at the header and footer, the two boxes that have been highlighted in, with the blue outline, you notice that as compared to the original, let's say as compared to the uh, sample on the left, it's more visually engaging as uh, and it's more eye-catching because of the use of the different types of colors, right? Okay, next thing is that for infographics, they tend to have distinctive columns or rows for the points presented. So it makes it easier for your audience to understand, uh, makes it easier for your audience to understand and process each of the different points. Uh, it's also more visually engaging as compared to the conventional bullet point approach of presenting information. And then the last thing um, is linked to the word graphics within infographics itself. So you notice that for infographics, they tend to use visuals in order to form an association with the points they are trying to drive. And also because visuals make it easier for people to understand or comprehend uh, points as compared to just plain text. Okay. Okay, so how many types of infographics do you all think there are? Uh, do you all want to type out your answers in the chat? And you want to try uh, 6, 10, 50, 10. Okay, so at least 7, no idea, 30, uh, 50. Okay, so 30 and 50 are quite large numbers. Uh. Okay, Jen Jenny has a very creative answer. So as many as one can create. So there are, it's true that there are a lot of different types of infographics, but if you look at it generally, right, there are five, five main types. There are five commonly used types of infographics. Then you will find this a lot in a lot of the uh, materials that you see nowadays, whether it's on social media or on the newspapers or even on TV. Okay. So what are these five different types? Here the first is the most uh, common. This is an informational infographic. So this is useful for highlighting key features. So the other thing you'll notice is that it uses a horizontal layout. And because if you use this informational infographic layout, uh, especially with a landscape orientation, right, you'll notice that you have a lot of space to make your graphic larger, okay? So this is very useful when you are highlighting uh, just some key points within your, for your product or some information that you want to highlight, okay? Okay, the next one is list infographic. So this one is more commonly used when you have uh, 
quite a number of points. And this one also can be used in this format, landscape orientation. But uh, more commonly, you will want to use it for a portrait orientation uh, design layout because then you can put in multiple points uh, like what you've seen for some of the infographic examples just now. Okay. So for list infographic, we can even go one step further and make it into a hierarchical infographic. So what this means is that information is organized in hierarchical order, maybe from best to worst or number one to the last uh, to the last in the category in the category uh, something like that um, yep so it's useful for ranking the content then again you notice that you want to use a vertical layout you want to use a vertical layout so that it's easier for your audience to follow which is the top and which is the bottom right so the other thing you notice is because for hierarchical infographic you tend to have quite a number of items on the list right so unless it's, let's say, you're comparing between three different items or four different items, if there's going to be five or more, you'll notice that your graphics use tend to be a lot smaller. So what that means is that the graphics cannot be so complex for this kind of uh, infographic. Okay, so you can also do this as a comparison infographic. So this one is very useful if you are comparing, maybe let's say, uh, before and after, pros and cons, uh, or even um, let's say pricing categories or different product, different product features. So usually this tends to have a two or more columns. So you need to have at least two columns to do a comparison naturally. So you can even go up to like three, four, or even five columns depending on what you're comparing. Okay. So again, you'll notice that this uses a vertical layout for the content that you're comparing. So each line they are comparing for is uh, one row. Right. Okay, so this is the last of the most common uh, types of infographics uh, created. So this is a process or timeline infographic. So this is very useful if you are demonstrating things like a process from let's say step one to the finish or even a timeline. Maybe let's say you're talking about the history of something from let's say 1960s to present. So this is where you can use a process or timeline infographic. So for this one, the layout can be either vertical or horizontal, meaning that depending on whether you want to use a landscape orientation for your design or a portrait uh, orientation for the design, right? Uh, it can either be in the vertical or horizontal format, okay? So again, we use uh, graphics to illustrate each point so that it's easier for your audience to understand uh, what each point is about, okay? Okay, so what are some of the common mistakes when designing infographics? So can I just check, um, is anyone creating infographics using Canva now? You know, share in the group chat, uh, has anyone had any experience creating infographics so far? Okay, so I see everyone has, uh, hasn't tried creating infographics before. Okay, so uh, you'll find that maybe for a lot of uh, agencies, right, they recommend for their, for their teams to use Canva to create infographics. But there's, uh, there are some limitations that I've observed as I was trying to create infographics within Canva. So you'll notice this is some of the mistakes that you will see during this, uh, this next segment as well. Okay. So what are some of the common mistakes when creating infographics? Okay, so first thing is, do you all realize that for this one, for this slide, right? The content is spilling out of the slide area, the design area. It's overflowing out of the design area. Okay. So this one is poorly framed content. Basically what this means is uh, the designer is unsure of how much space they have to put the content within the slide. So they actually overshot the actual design area. And then after that, the content comes out uh, overspilled as a result. Okay. So what happens is you crop up part of the content that you're trying to present. 
Okay, this one is underutilized content spaces, meaning that you notice that for this slide, this sample, right, on the in the middle area, this is what we call the body area. Um, you notice that on the left and right side, there's a lot of space, right? So you're not maximizing the space on this uh, in this body area. So this is underutilized content spaces. Okay, so for this for this infographic, for example. Uh, anyone notice what's wrong with it? Okay, can anyone notice anything wrong with it? Okay, you're very sharp. Uh, so you have noticed that uh, for this infographic itself, the problem is the alignment, right? Okay, so you'll notice that for some tools like Canva, for example, it's a bit more difficult to ensure that your content is aligned. Uh, even when you're creating with PowerPoint, uh, I think from what I've observed so far, alignment also tends to be quite a quite a jarring issue that people are still, uh, it's quite a jarring issue that a lot of people are still facing these days. So you'll find that maybe the content is, uh, content on the slides looks good, but then the alignment is off. Okay, so Shin has brought out another interesting observation. Huh? So one USD is in bold and the other one is not in bold. Okay, so that's a good observation. Uh, it's also something that I'll talk a little bit more about later when I share the uh, framework that we'll be using during the workshop itself. Okay. Okay, so what about this slide? What do you all, what about, uh, what do you all feel about the color choice used for the infographic in this slide? Text doesn't stand out, not enough contrast, font color, poor contrast. Not sure what is the highlight. Okay, so very good. Once again, you have got it. So this is a poorly applied text colors. So I think normally you wouldn't find this kind of, uh, this these two colors uh, being used together. So this is just an example to illustrate the contrast in the colors used. Doesn't highlight what's more important, not poor enough for text color not attractive, too many colors, no emphasis, right? Okay, so poorly applied text colors. Okay, what about this slide? Anyone spot what's wrong with this slide? Okay, uh, yep. Again, you're quite sharp. So some of you all have noticed uh, what's wrong with this image really. Yeah. So basically it's the watermark or the, yeah, the watermark on the images. So you notice quite commonly, especially when you search for images or graphics on Google, some of them will have these watermarks on them, right? Yep, so the mistake here is that the person is using the, actually to begin with, you know, you know shouldn't even be using images with watermarks on them. So actually for these cases where you find, let's say the image with Shutterstock print, uh, the Shutterstock watermark over it, unless you are a Shutterstock subscriber, uh, you shouldn't be using the images that you find on Google. Okay, so they put those watermarks there to prevent people from using those images for free. Okay, so this is a misuse of intellectual property. Okay, so Having understood these uh, five different mistakes, as well as the five common types of infographics that people create, can you all see the similarities between the five types of infographics uh, mentioned just now, as well as the, can you see the similarities between the five common types of infographics mentioned just now in the designs here? Okay, so if you look at it, you can see some of it already, right? So like, for example, this is a list infographic, the first one. Then for the second one, you can see at the top is actually a timeline infographic, right? Then this is a so list infographics. Then here you have informational infographic. So it's displayed in the horizontal layout for the one in the middle. And then for the one, uh, with the hand washing one, you also see it's so informational, presented in horizontal layout, but with two rows instead of one, right? 
Okay, so having identified the different types of uh, common types of infographics, do you all think you'll be able to create something like that? On a scale of 1 to 10, can you all put down in the group chat how confident you all are in creating this kind of infographics? Seven, eight, six. Okay, so a high level of confidence here. Five, three, five, okay, so in general, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of, a uh, lot of you have expressed that uh, a rating of more than five. So I think that's quite high confidence that you'll be able to create infographic like that, right? So now if I were to ask you to create the infographic uh, using a blank PowerPoint, uh, you should be able to do it, right? Okay, so for those who are not very confident, just remember this. If you are not really sure how to design content uh, on PowerPoint, whether it's just for your text or whether you need to create infographics for work, right? You don't need to have talent for good design. At the very least, if you have a framework, you will still be able to design something that looks good. Okay? So this is uh, the framework that I was sharing about just now. This is called the five C's of infographic design. So there are five different aspects which all good infographics should have. First is contextualization or understanding what is the messaging or the theme behind the messaging uh, for the infographic that you're trying to create. Next is the composition or the fundamental or basic design language of the infographic, followed by consistency. We we'll talk about brand and visual consistency of the infographic, whether it's with uh, other materials by your agency or other materials that you've created for your team. Okay, next we talk about conciseness because usually uh, before you create any type of infographic or before you create any that you realize that you have a lot of information to sift through. So the key question here is how do you identify which information you want your audience to look at? What, what information do you want your audience to focus on? And then lastly is clarity or the type of uh, graphics and media that you use for your infographics. Right? Okay, so some have mentioned also uh, Galaxy A30 has mentioned downloading free icons. Uh, it will be 10. If you can download free icons, you'll be able to do 10 out of 10 job, right? Okay, so that's actually something that we'll be sharing during the two-day workshop as well. So for Ivy, yes, uh, some of you who are more familiar with, let's say, Photoshop or Publisher, you can use uh, Publisher or Photoshop for designing infographics, but uh, what we're covering for today's webinar is more towards uh, using PowerPoint for creating infographics. So actually, there are a lot of different uh, ways, I mean, a lot of different purposes or functions that you can create the infographics for using PowerPoint. I think the most obvious and uh, most common use for creating infographics in PowerPoint, of course, is for presentations, for text, because even for presentations itself, you'll notice that there's a growing shift towards uh, text which are more visually intuitive. So there are more infographic style presentations as well. Okay. So for Tracy mentioned there are what are PowerPoint tools that can be used for creating infographics, right? So actually that's something that we'll be sharing in the workshop itself. But basically uh, during the workshop, we will be covering more on the different uh, tools that you'll be using to create infographics. So some of these tools that I've been taught in past workshops are a lot uh, more complex to use than what participants uh, initially thought, or these are tools or functions that they never knew existed in PowerPoint. So that's something that uh, you definitely can take away from the workshop itself. Okay, so now I'll just do a quick sneak preview of what you'll be learning during this two-day workshop. So as mentioned, today we'll be covering only the uh, theoretical aspect. So for that, for the five C's of infographic design, right, we'll be looking at contextualization. So contextualization are basically the uh, considerations that you make before designing an infographic. So uh, if you all know soon to be as he's saying, right, so the general who wins the battle makes many calculations before the battle is fought. Okay, so if you want to win your audience, you have to take a lot of, uh, make a lot of considerations before you design the infographic as well. Okay. 
Okay, so three key things that you have to look at is how will the infographic be disseminated, who will be reviewing the information, and what content will you be presenting. Okay, so for this, we look at these three different aspects, medium, audience, and content. Okay, so first we look at medium. So medium basically covers what is the, how will your infographic be disseminated. So there's two different types, print and digital medium. Print basically means anything that you create and then after that you print out maybe in the form of a flyer or a booklet or even part of let's say training materials for example. Then digital of course is things like your EDMs and uh, mailers or even presentations. Okay, so some other examples for print mediums for disseminating infographics. So if you think, if you try to recall uh, maybe things that you've seen around Singapore maybe in the past few months you notice like for example, for signboards, you'll, you'll start to notice that a lot of the posters that you see on signboards nowadays, they use a infographic format, especially if it's trying to inform you on a different aspects or different things uh, or topics, right? Okay, sorry, I see a lot of questions in the uh, chat. Uh. Just give me a moment to go through them. Okay, so uh, for this recording, it will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, I think Aventis has mentioned that it will be uploaded within one one day or one working day. So uh, my colleague Abigail is actually in the chat. So if she can help to address that query, it would be great. Uh, for Angeline, um, so for this course, it will depend on the, for this course, I think, it might be a bit of a challenge, but no worries because we will be providing quite close guidance throughout the entire workshop. So basically, the uh, how the workshop will run is as we go through the different steps of the five Cs, right? Let's say we are at composition and we are working on how to create the basic fundamental design language for the, for the infographic design. Um, once you're done with sharing your steps, we will share the slide with the, with the class. We will share your screen with the class so that um, we can see what are the areas of improvement and what are the steps that you've, got, you've gotten correct, okay? Okay, Ping, so infographics for email, right? I think it will depend on what kind of infographics you're looking at. But broadly speaking, right, with this, with the know how to create these five different types of infographics, you should be able to create quite a wide, wide range of uh, infographics uh, already. So as mentioned by some of the other participants just now, right? I mean, having understood the different types of infographics, their confidence level to create different types of, uh, the different types of infographics ranging from informational to timeline is uh, higher than five. Uh. Okay, for the slides for today, uh, I can share them. Um, yeah, so later, I think I, I can drop them inside the group chat. So for those who want the slides, uh, it would be good if you all can stay a bit after the session. Then at the same time, you can, uh, you can do a Q&A session then as well. Okay. Sorry, so I think I missed out the question from, so now is it? What infographics will be used for publishing? So now to clarify for your question, do you mean uh, what types of infographics design will be used for publishing? Okay, so if that's your question, then uh, it will really depend on what kind of information you are trying to communicate. So actually for this part in the contextualization, we will cover a bit more We'll cover a bit more on how to determine what type of infographic to use uh, when determining before designing the infographic itself. Okay, so for online blog itself, you can actually just create the infographic within PowerPoint and then after you can save the infographic uh, from there as well. So the only question is how to create the different types of infographic or what which type of infographic you want to use for a blog. So are you comparing a product or are you listing out some uh, maybe product highlights or key factors that you want your audience to take note of? Or is it a process? So like, is it a timeline infographic that you need to create for your, for your blog? Okay, so uh, we'll cover a bit more about that in a bit. So for now, I'll just go ahead with this session first. Okay, so as mentioned just now, common print mediums for disseminating infographics. We have signboard, 
uh, booklets, handouts, and pamphlets, as mentioned just now. Okay. Then for digital mediums for infographics, we have emails, e-banners. This one can use. Uh, you can create. You can actually create the infographic even for websites, uh, for your social media banner and stuff like that. And then after that, presentations and PDF. Okay. Okay. So, can you just uh, share your thoughts on what kind of layout should be used? Which slide orientation, whether it's portrait or landscape, should be used for booklet, present uh, presentation, or PDF? Okay, for booklet, which type of slide orientation should be used? Yeah, I see portrait. Okay, so very good. So for booklet, we have portrait. Okay, what about presentation? Portrait landscape portrait uh, by Jasper. Booklet portrait. Um, Yep, Jenny, you're right to say that it depends, but maybe uh, can you specify a bit more about what it depends on? Okay, so depends on the contents. Yes, correct. So it will depend on the type of content you are presenting. But of course, as with any case, uh, when you are presenting infographics, the key thing is you want to optimize your visual area. So when we talk about presentation, uh, as mentioned by the other participants, yes, you should be using a landscape orientation for your slide so that you can maximize the space available within, the, within your computer screen, the screen that you're sharing, right? Okay, what about for PDF? Okay, so you're, you're really very sharp. Uh. So I've noticed uh, quite a number of you have mentioned um, for PDF, you can use either portrait or landscape. So very good. So for PDF, actually, it's quite a special case because it really depends on what you are creating the infographic for or what you're creating the PDF for, sorry. So let's say, for example, if you want to create a, a mailer, like uh, something that you send out to clients or context to share with them some information. Um, I would say that a landscape orientation would be better because especially when you are on the go, nowadays a lot of people when they access their PDF from their emails or WhatsApp, they usually do it while they're on the go. So the key thing to take note of here is that when it's in landscape format, it's easier for your audience to read through the information. Because if you think about it for portrait, right, if you have, if you have to read through it on the phone, First thing is the portrait, the default portrait orientation that your phone is in, right? The text will be very small, right? So for landscape, on the other hand, when you view it in landscape mode on, on your phone, the text and the visuals will be, will be optimized within the screen itself, right? Okay, so very good. So next, the, the next consideration that we'll look at is the audience. So who is your infographic going to be for? Okay. Okay, so the secret to understanding your audience is to think like your audience. Okay, so how does your audience determine the type of content presented? Okay, so anyone heard of this thing called elaboration likelihood method before? Has anyone heard of this uh, elaboration likelihood method? Okay, so basically this is a, it's a concept that was derived uh, in psychology. To, yep. Okay, so this is a concept that was uh, derived from psychology studies on sales and advertising tactics, okay? So basically elaboration likelihood method covers, as you can see, low and high elaboration likelihood, right? So this is something like how it works. So let's say this is your target audience on the screen, uh, the guy in the center, the avatar in the center of the screen now. So if it's a low elaboration likelihood audience, focus on making the message more attractive. 
So for low elaboration likelihood audiences, they are less likely to evaluate the content presented. Then you want to focus more on the pros and cons of the message and attractive messages work better. Okay? Whereas for high elaboration likelihood audience, they tend to be more deliberate when they are going through the content presented. So they, you have to be more meticulous with the kind of information that you present to them. Usually this is the type of audience that you want to present more statistics or data to, especially from credible sources. Okay. Okay, so can anyone uh, think whether you know of someone who is a uh, high elaboration likelihood method and someone who is low elaboration likelihood method? Okay, so maybe I, maybe I can rephrase the question a bit. Yeah, so uh, Jessica has mentioned manager is high elaboration likelihood, right? So you notice that for bosses especially, they tend to be more high elaboration likelihood. They are very uh, meticulous with the kind of information they, they see. And then when you present data, it has to come from very credible sources, right? Okay, so Xiao Hui has mentioned a very good point. One other thing to take note of is that uh, you can't always have extremes. That means, especially when you are sending out, let's say, content or infographic to a general audience, you have to strike a balance between both, right? So you have to have uh, ample amounts of credible data as well as making the message more attractive for your audience, right? Okay, so see a lot of high for CEOs, managers, uh, government officials. Okay, and then for non-experts, they tend to be low. Okay, so usually, actually, if you, if you think about it, right, um, when, you look at, when you look at advertisements in the public nowadays, they tend to be more low elaboration likelihood, right? You all realize that for most adverts that you see nowadays, they tend to be more focused on pros and cons or perks and making the messages more attractive. Whereas for high leverage, for uh, when you're doing presentations at work, they tend to be more detailed, right? Okay, so key thing here is depending on who is your infographic going to be for, you have to take into consideration uh, whether they are more towards the high or low elaboration likelihood audiences and then structure your content accordingly, okay? Okay, so as an example, let's look at these two. Okay, so this is a low elaboration likelihood uh, type of slide, whereas this may be something that will appeal more to a high elaboration likelihood uh, audience. So high elaboration likelihood, they want to see facts and figures, they're more focused on data as compared to visuals, okay? Okay, um, okay, Jenny has brought up a very interesting question. So if I'm a trainer, does it mean that I have to keep changing my slides due to low or high elaboration likelihood participants? So I think in general, you find that especially as a trainer, you'll find that your content now is quite balanced between low and high, right? Cause you have to have data to back up some of your concepts that you want to teach your class, especially if it's related to topics, let's say like leadership or human resource management, right? Whereas on the other hand, you have to have some interesting content in order to liven up the class at uh, certain points as well. Right, what do you think Jenny? So Cindy has also mentioned high ones could be boring. So I think boring is a very subjective word because it might be boring to uh, some audiences, but to other audiences, they might be more interested in it. So it's the same as looking as looking at, let's say, uh, uh, prospectors by a company. Let's say you look at the annual report uh, that you can find on SGX for the listed companies, right? They tend to be very technical, right? those serious investors, they tend to focus a lot more on these prospectors as compared to let's say a vlog or a website 
like let's say money sense or something like that, which tells you what are the top five uh, stocks that you can invest in today. Right? So it ultimately depends on who your target audience is. Uh, Jenny, for this uh, webinar, I don't have uh, any more examples for high and low to show. Eh? Sorry, uh, Louis, yeah, I don't have any more examples of high and low to share, show during this session itself. Uh, yeah, so Jenny has mentioned that it's the job of the trainer to be an effective facilitator regardless of participants. Yes, uh, I totally agree with this. Okay, so I think uh, before we conduct any workshop, usually we do a lot of uh, homework behind the scenes, right? Prepare for the workshop itself. And then even then we will have backup content um, so that we can uh, use it. If let's say we notice that the audience is more skewed towards uh, one type of topic other than the other, so that we can facilitate the learning and make sure that it's more meaningful for the participants, right? Okay. So the last thing to consider is the content. Okay, so what type of information should be included? So there's a very simple way to determine what type of information to include from, let's say, your huge chunk of content. So let's say, for example, all the info that you need for your infographics comes from, let's say, Word documents, uh, Excel sheets, and then maybe even a website, uh, any web articles or existing PowerPoint slides, right? So the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what is the desired outcome of your infographic? That means, what is the reaction or call to action that you want your audiences to have after they look at the infographic? Okay. So based on that, then you can determine what type of information uh, you should include in the infographic itself so that you can, so, so you can sort of uh, skew your audience towards the desired outcome. That means to skew your audience to to guide them to reach your desired outcome, your targeted outcome. Then lastly is how should the information be presented? So this is where you determine what type of infographic to use, right? So let's say for example, if you're talking about a process of naturally, you should be using something like a timeline infographic. So you're doing, uh, if the focus of your infographic is to compare between your product versus your competitor's product, then you want to do a comparison infographic, right? Okay, so this is how you can determine the type of infographic to use uh, for when before designing the infographic itself. Okay, so the other four C's, composition, consistency, conciseness, and clarity will focus more on how to design the infographic from scratch in PowerPoint. That means using a blank slide without relying on smart art or anything like that. So why that's useful is because once you learn how to do that, regardless of whatever type of uh, infographic you have to create, uh, at least you have more flexibility, more creativity in uh, creating as compared to relying on the generalized template, which I find is so quite constrained in the way that you can create the content because basically what they do is when you create a smart art infographic, everything is preset in the infographic itself already. Okay. Okay, so with that, I've come to the uh, end of the preview session. So now I think we can uh, use the rest of the time for Q&A. So do you have any questions so far? Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, you can either write it in the chat or unmute yourselves. Uh, and then after that, share the question with the class. Okay, so uh, Arno and Billy have both raised some very interesting questions. So uh, for Arno, we will be covering the rest of the four Cs uh, during the, the workshop itself. Yeah, because there's a lot, quite a bit of hands-on work involved for the using the four Cs to develop infographics. 
So basically what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at how to cover, how to design different types of the graphics using the five C's, using the five C's in total uh, during the workshop itself. Okay, uh, Billy, is it safe to use picture from Google without infringement of copyrights? Uh, I would recommend that actually nowadays because there are a lot of uh, media media free, uh, sorry, royalty free media resources, right? Um, go and use those sources to when searching for images. If you are using images from Google, make sure that you set the uh, image to for reuse with modification. But even then, you'll find that a lot of the results that you get are not very nice because they tend to be more of the amatory shots taken by uh, maybe let's say someone who is just trying to share a picture of uh, an object, for example. Okay, and the other case is you'll find a lot of the images from Wikipedia or Wiki, uh, Wikimedia. Okay. Okay, for Susan, a very good question. How can you present a graph or chart as an infographic without having an information overload? So for this question, first I have to ask, is it for a presentation or is it uh, just a general infographic? presentation, uh, finance presentation. So in general, uh, linking to the four C's, right? Uh, for, sorry, linking to the five C's for conciseness. I would say if you have a lot of information within the slide, there are two approaches that you can use, especially when you're presenting for graphs or charts. The first approach is you use uh, animations to help to guide your audience through the different aspects of the chart or the data that you want to present to them. Second and second approach that I recommend more often is using multiple slides to present the information. Cause it's better to spread out the information and guide your audience uh, to go forward and then uh, look forward to even more information as compared to overwhelming them within one slide itself. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see some other questions. Okay, uh, Jessica has brought up a very interesting question. So alignment of text usually aligned to the top, middle or bottom. Okay, so for this, you have to ask yourself which, uh, which part of the slide area the text is in. So generally speaking, there are three distinctive uh, areas within a slide. The topmost area is called the header. Okay, let me just uh, use this as an example. Okay, so if you look at this slide, for example, you see that the top part uh, with the icon and then the text on top, that is the header. The content area in the center is the body. And then lastly, you have the footer where the, small the smallest text is. Okay, so for the header, you want the text to be aligned top. And then for the footer, you want the text to be aligned bottom. For the body area, uh, it will depend on where the text box is. So like for example, in this case, I have the text box, uh, the text aligned at top. Okay, so this way I create the most amount of space uh, between the header body and the footer areas so that there's a more white space in between the three distinctive areas. Okay. Okay, hang on. Uh. Um, Susan, I'll get, back, get to you in a moment. Okay, so for royalty-free media sites, for this preview session, I'll just share one that y'all can check out. Okay, so anyone ever heard of this one, unsplash.com? So this is one of the royalty-free stock image sites that you can use. Okay, then, um, yeah, as Jessica mentioned, you can also try Envato. Uh, the other one that you can get royalty free images from, but this one is also paid, similar to Envato, is actually Canva. So I'm not really a fan of Canva's uh, design, design uh, functions, uh, like their, yeah, I'm not really a fan of their design function, but I think that their stock image library is quite good. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, let me see uh, any other questions. Okay, Susan, uh, is using animation in presentation considered informal and how much is not too much animation in PowerPoint? Okay, so this is a very good question because I think uh, there is a, it will ultimately depend on what kind of animation you're using within the slides. So generally, I would say go for something which is more subtle, something that is not too over the top. Uh, like maybe like let's say like a 90s 1990s commercial or 80s commercial so don't go and use those uh, spinning effects where the text spins into the slide area or boomerangs or bounces I think that is a bit tacky so if you want to use animations uh, I think in general the more subtle ones are better so like, let's say for example if you want to introduce content within a slide uh, use fade or appear so I prefer fade because it has this uh, easing effect. So this is something that you'll, you'll find um, not very often within uh, the animation functions in PowerPoint. Uh, so appear basically means that the content just appears on the slide itself. Whereas for fade, the content gradually appears. So there's an easing effect. It's a bit more, the effect is a bit softer as compared to appear. Then for, if you want to show some form of motion, so like, for example, if you look at the slide itself. Okay, so let's say, for example, for this slide. If I want to show motion, you can use a wipe. So wipe, basically, you can set the direction that the content is moving from. Okay. Okay, so hope I managed to answer your question, Susan. So how much is not too much animation in PowerPoint? I would say uh, it really depends on how much information you have within a slide. But then again, I would say, uh, I recommend that you try to spread out information over multiple slides so that the animations used within the slide itself is uh, not too overwhelming. And then the other thing is try not to have so many animations uh, appearing and disappearing animations within a slide. Otherwise, it looks very flashy or may even come across as you're trying to hide, off, hide some information. Okay, so can you imagine if let's say text appears, then before the person can even read it, it just disappears off screen. Right, so I would recommend that you try to spread out the content over multiple slides so that the animations used can be more tastefully executed. Okay, Billy, I think it will depend on, for color scale in PowerPoint, it will really depend on the theme that you're going for within your slide. So what we cover in consistency is actually how to select the colors uh, for your infographic design. Okay, so one, okay, so one trick that I will share with you all today is, let's say if you don't have any fixed colors that you uh, using for your infographic design, right? Like you don't have any fixed colors that you're using for your infographic. Just think of one color which you really think will look good on your infographic. Then let's say for example, the color is aquamarine, right? Just go and search Google for this thing. Aquamarine Pantone. So basically it will show you a spectrum of colors which complement the, let's say for example, aquamarine. So it complements that color so that when when so when you look at this pantone, you have a better idea of how to select the colors for your for your infographic or your slide design. Okay. So there's no better between pastel or bright. Ultimately, it also depends on what kind of mood you are trying to set your audience in, uh, what kind of product you're trying to sell, right? So let us say, for example, if your your deck is about selling, let's say for example, a car. Uh, pastel colors might not work as well as compared to more conservative or muted colors, like let's say black or white, or even dark, darker shades of red or green or blue, right? Okay, uh, Jessica, to address your questions, how to brainwash other people, stop using the weird animation. Um, I think that's something that we can't really control. Uh, people will continue using weird animations, uh, even maybe in the next five years. The only thing we, we, that we can do is uh, use what we think is the most uh, tasteful for our decks. And then as long as 
the people who are we are showing the decks appreciate the content that we're creating or the effects that we use that's i think that's good enough already right okay anyone else have any other questions okay uh shane has brought up a very interesting question how to customize the color of the chart as you mean the color spectrum the color spectrum that you get when you're trying to select colors in powerpoint is it okay so uh probably this is one thing that i can share with you all during today's workshop okay so this is something that you can actually go and try after you leave the workshop today okay so if you want to change the color spectrum within powerpoint let's say i'm using a new presentation right what you do is uh in a new presentation, go to view, okay? So view is on the top tab in PowerPoint. Huh? So go to view, select Slide Master, okay? Okay, so in Slide Master, this is, for those who haven't been into Slide Master yet, Slide Master is basically the sort of, the, you can think of it as the backstage for your presentation. Okay, so Slide Master is where uh, all your layouts are kept. So you see, uh, whenever you want to use a different template in PowerPoint, you'll see all these different layouts, right? So this is where all your layouts are kept. Okay. So if you want to change the color for your deck, right? What you can do is in Slide Master, click on the Slide Master tab. So it's the one next to File, next to the File tab. Click on Slide Master tab. So in the tab, you'll see there's a few different functions, right? There's Edit Master, master layout, edit theme, and background. So what I do is select the, in background, select colors. So you see these are all the different color tones within your slides itself, right? So if you see something that you like here, you can actually just use it. Alternatively, if you don't really like this color scheme, you can go to customize colors. So in customize colors, you can actually select the different colors that you want. Okay, you can select the different shades of colors that you want for your for your deck, and then it will it will show when you, it, uh, it will it will show when you save the changes. Okay. So let's say for example here, if I set everything to this shade of blue. Okay, so if I set everything to this shade of blue, you'll notice that now my background color is blue. So let's say now I create a shade, right? If I want to change the color, everything here is blue. Okay? So that's how you change the color scheme of your slide. I mean of your, your the color, wind, uh, color wheel of your deck. Okay? Okay, is there any number of colors to use in one page? So this is also something that we'll be covering during the uh, workshop itself. Okay. Chanel for websites with icons, I'll be sharing that more during the workshop itself. Okay, uh, notice two people raise their hands. You want to share your questions in the chat? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're okay. Pamela, the workshop is on 21st August. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else have any other questions? Uh, okay, Ming, what other information would you like about the workshop?
Okay, so as uh, shown on the screen, right, um, the next round of the workshop will be on 21st August. Um, for the workshop, I believe it should be a live stream, so it's similar to this uh, Zoom webinar format. So we'll be doing the workshop via Zoom. Um, then we'll be doing hands-on work as well. So during the workshop itself, everyone will need to have a PowerPoint on their desktop and it's actually uh, compulsory to use your, your desktop or your laptop um, for the workshop itself as compared to mobile so that you can do the hands-on activities. Okay, so during the workshop day itself, we'll be, as mentioned just now, we'll be covering more about the different, uh, different components of the five Cs. Okay, uh, don't mention it, Ki-kun. So, uh, we will also go more in-depth into things like the color scheme within the slide itself, uh, how to structure the different layouts of the contents within your infographics. And then also, we will look at how to create uh, infographics in both landscape and portrait orientation. Okay. Uh, Angeline, you mentioned it would be challenging because uh, of the because of the the steps involved or the processes involved. Is it okay? So, according to my colleague Abigail, right? So, uh, sorry about the mistake on my part. So, it seems that for now the session will be face to face. So, if it's a face to face session, it will be even better. Because face to face means that we can I can provide direct guidance for each of the participants. So one of the key differences between uh, Zoom and for face to face sessions is that for face to face, uh, I'll be able to go around during the session itself to provide uh, guidance and I think it'll be easier to show you or to demonstrate how to find the different functions within PowerPoint uh, within PowerPoint for, to develop the infographics itself. Okay. Okay, so I believe the venue will be at the Aventis uh, Training Center. So that is at, um, what's the hotel? Hang on. Uh. So that will be at Orchard, in the Orchard area, uh, near to Somerset area. Uh. Hey, uh, Angeline, no worries about that because uh, for my teaching style, we will only proceed when everyone has gotten the steps. So we use a two-level two approach uh, in order to achieve that. First is the people with sitting within the same uh, table. You'll help each other. So that also helps you to reinforce your own learning. Then second level is I'll go around the room to provide guidance. So in general, I find from workshops, my observation is that there tends, there's always uh, people who are very fast when, when it comes to grasping the steps. So those who are done, um, just help those who are around you. And then you'll be able to help us to complete the workshop faster as well. So you'll complete the different components of the workshop faster as well. Then of course, I'll also go around to provide guidance. Uh, hang on, let me see what are the other questions. Huh? Uh, for computer, okay, so computer will only be provided if you don't bring your, like if you don't have a computer. Uh, in general, most of the times when the computer is provided, it's usually because the participant has, let's say, only has a government issued laptop. Yeah, so I recommend that if you have your own laptops, please do bring them. Yeah. Okay, so the participants within the class will depend on how many people uh, sign up for the workshop for the day itself. Okay, so uh, the largest number that we've had for a infographics design workshop so far is, I think, close to 25 people. Yeah, so close to 25, but we'll try to keep that figure 
We try to make sure that figure does, doesn't cross over 25 so that I can attend to each and every one of you during the workshop itself. Okay. Okay, so for those who are asking about the pricing for a two-day workshop or one-day workshop and then for subsidies, right, I think my colleague can, uh, my colleague Abigail can help you with that. Okay, anyone else have any other questions? Uh, okay, Angeline, we no need to complete a test uh, before a cert will be issued. So basically, there will just be some activities along the way so that uh, we can ensure that, uh, like for each of you, after you all have completed the maybe one day or two day workshop, right, you have at least you are able to grasp the concepts. So the key focus here is not on getting, on passing some assessment, it's making sure that you understand and are able to apply what is being taught during the workshop so that beyond the actual workshop itself, right, when you apply this, when you try to apply this um, in your work, you'll be able to do so. Okay. Okay, uh, anyone else have any other questions? Okay, so maybe we have uh, one more question. If anyone has any other questions, can we have one more, just one more question and then after that we can wrap up the session. Uh, Lin Li, what's the question with regards to the slides? As in the slides for, oh, the slides for the webinar just now, is it? Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I'll help you to upload the webinar slides now. Uh, Jessica, I'll get back to you on your question in a bit. Okay, so uh, I think Jessica has asked a very interesting question. Huh? Okay, so on bilingual slides, right, I would say that uh, you just have to be very careful with the, you have to be very careful with your content alignment and then also how much, the, how much space your text content is occupying. Uh, and then also the text size, I mean the font size for your content itself, okay? And I'll just share the, I'll share the slides now. Okay, so do you all see it? Uh, put it in the group chat already. Okay. Uh, yep, Jessica, I uh, hope that hope I managed to address your query on bilingual slides just now. Uh, one final note to add on that for bilingual slides, right, is as much as possible, I recommend, if possible, create a Chinese and an English version instead of creating bilingual slides. Because as mentioned just now with bilingual slides, I think 
the main thing that you realize is that your font size is definitely going to be compromised. So when your font size is going to be smaller, it's going to make it harder for your audience to read the text as well. Okay, then with bilingual slides again, you have to be more um, conscious of the copy of both slides, which means that the person creating the deck has to be uh, well-versed in English and Chinese. Because something which sounds smooth and catchy in English might not sound as smooth and catchy in Chinese. Okay? Okay, so um, if anyone, if everyone is okay with the, uh, satisfied with the answers given, how to get the slide in this chat. Kikun, do you mean this slide that I'm sharing now? Uh, if you mean this slide that I'm sharing now, can, you can actually take a screenshot of it by finding the print screen button on your desktop, I mean on your laptop. Use the print screen, the print screen key to take a screenshot of it. For the workshop slides, just now I've, sh I've shared it in the uh, chat. As I've shared it in the chat already. Okay, hang on. Huh? Let me just uh, share it again. Okay. okay, so it's the PDF that I'm sending over now. Huh? It's about a six megabyte file. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you all for attending the session as well. I hope that you all found it useful. Okay, so for those who are leaving already, I uh, hope you all have a good weekend and look forward to seeing you during the workshop itself. Okay, so for those who haven't gotten the file, um, it's just been sent through. So let me know if you are still not able to get the file. Okay, thank you all for attending today's workshop. Thank you all for your kind words. Yep, so look forward to seeing you all during the session. But have a good weekend first. Okay, have a good weekend, uh, have a good weekend everybody. Okay, so I see some, some of you are still having trouble getting the file, is it? Um, hang on, uh, let me see if I can create a, a folder on G Drive, then after that, I'll send the link over here. Just give me a moment.